Okay, so I'll just start from the beginning. Uh, Revelation 20, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Okay, so to me, this when the angel comes down from heaven, this is uh, John being shown a new vision. Okay, so it, like in Revelation 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So, in my opinion, each time an angel is being shown to John, it's a new vision. And it's a new picture, in a sense, that's being painted. And uh, so this is, I think, key to understand this in Revelation 20, because a lot of people make the mistake of thinking uh, Revelation 20 is a continuation from Revelation 19. And it's not. It's just a new vision being shown to John. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really good point. I was actually going to just bring up Revelation 1.1, just how it says it was signified by his angel, so that these are just pictures and sort of moving metaphors to show the future things that are to pass and the things that are to pass. They're not exactly, it's not being literal about everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's uh, speaking in spiritual terms, in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and so that's important to understand because, you, you know, you see, I, I think it's probably a, not an, an, un it's not an uncommon mistake for new believers or new readers to make thinking everything's a continuation. But if you've read the book of Revelation, you know, 50 times or so, you'll you start to get the sense that there are many descriptions, many what I call paintings with words, if you will, uh, that are being shown to John. And, you know, some of them are a large sense. Some are some are more centered, uh, but each one has its own purpose. Okay, yeah, I could, I could agree with that. They're kind of okay. like uh, moving, moving hieroglyphs almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're getting a different angle, in a sense, almost a different angle of the same thing. Uh, just we're just showing different, uh, different ways and different things, uh, giving us uh, some insight on on what's happening now and what's going to happen in the future and and that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. So in verse two, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. Okay. So in that old serpent, the devil that goes all the way back to Genesis three. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so uh, so it's interesting here that the the dragon or the devil is bound for a thousand years. And obviously uh, people have the question, well, what's that mean? He's bound for a thousand years because we read, you know, verses like uh, the devil is uh, um, like a Walk, walking around as a lion. Yeah. Whom he may devour. Right. Lion seek. <clears throat> what verse is that? Is this showing up clearly on your screen? Yeah. Okay, Clear good. Clear as day. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So uh, the obvious question would be, how is, if if he is bound right now, how is, how is he walking about and uh, devouring? Um, so um, I, th I think to me the easiest way to explain this is that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, Satan has no power over you. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, uh, it's like uh, I, you know, I'm. I could pick a, probably a hundred verses here, but uh, Jesus says, uh, "He that believes in me shall never die." Right? 
Uh, yeah. Whoever lives and believeth yeah. in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And so that's what, uh, you know, th that's how the devil is bound is because he doesn't have power over us that are sealed with the holy seal of God. Agreed. Yeah. I feel like, yeah. And he's bound in that he's, he can deceive the nations no more. Right. Right. In that one. Exactly. Remember, that is. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. And you know, if you read Job, uh, Satan, uh, or I, I'm, I'm sorry, God permitted Satan to, you know, do certain things, but he put limits on them. And the same could be said here, and that's going to be important here in a little bit, what it means to be let loose, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah so go to verse 3, <clears throat> and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And it took me a while to figure out, what's that mean, loosed a little season? Well, it finally came to me, but um, I wonder if I should read the rest of it first. Well, basically, that loosed for a little season is the wrath of God. When we are lifted up, because <clears throat> like uh, I think Paul says, and uh, was it Thessalonians, I think? Yeah, it's Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, yeah, when we... When uh, first. Our first, first Thessalonians, yeah. Yeah, when we, uh, which are alive, shall remain, be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so sh we ever, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is when... Uh, this is parallel with uh, like Matthew twenty four, thirty one or thirty thirty one when uh, the when the angels gather together the elect, right? Yeah. Okay. So when that happens, that's when the wrath of God is going to be poured upon the whole earth. Yeah. Okay. Does that, okay. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like the parable of the. Uh... The wheat and the tares, when the tares are bound up and cast into the lake of fire. Yeah, exactly. There's so many parallels. It's amazing, really. And it, it's it, so much of the Bible is talking about the same thing, just different ways. For sure. And lots of people try to complicate it and make oh, all yeah. these different little doctrines that don't really have any basis in the scriptures. Oh, you're not kidding. And what's that? Uh, what's that verse? Uh, but I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so it it should be simple. It just you know you got to read and study and pray and and. Um, it takes time to learn and understand, just like with everything in life, but uh, it's going to get easier. It's going to get more simplified. It's not going to get complicated, like you said, with all these doctrines that complicate everything and, and uh, confuse everybody. And it's unbelievable, in my opinion, how many people are, are wanting to hear these fantastic doctrines that are not based on the Bible at all. Yeah. It's what they, it's what the Bible, the Bible warns us about that, right? How it says people will have itching ears and they'll turn their, turn themselves away from good doctrine or whatever and be turned unto fables or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. For they the time will come them. when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust. And see, this is what I'd like to point out is they're, they're doing this out of their own lust. And so you see all these doctrines uh, that are, basic, are based on lust, on sexual obsession. And the serpent seed doctrine is one example of that. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yeah. And it's the idea is that the serpent had sex with Eve, and Eve had Cain. That's, Which that's, is just outrageous because the Bible clearly says... Adam knew his wife, and she bare Cain. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, it, that, <laughs> that should be that should be over. That discussion should be over. This clearly, of course, now people they'll read that and they'll say, "Well, that's that's wrong, right?" And it's so crazy that you know people would even suggest that this verse is not right. And Adam, like you just said, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, "I have gotten a man." From the Lord. And to me, it's so crazy because if you read Genesis 2, God says that uh, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, lest thee die. Is that or there, there? For in the day that thou eatest, therefore thou shalt surely die. And then what's the First thing that, uh, that, uh, well, the first thing the serpent says is, Yea, has God said? And then he says, Ye shall not surely die. The complete opposite of what God said in chapter 2 in Genesis 3, the, the serpent is twisting the word of God. And then in Genesis 4, People are saying, well, that's not true. It's like, who are you? You're just one chapter away from an example of the serpent twisting the Word of God, doubt, getting Eve to doubt the Word of God, and now you're going to try to get people to doubt Genesis 4? <clears throat> that's crazy. Yeah, and that's another point we should bring up, is that we both believe, I believe, that the King James Version, the... 1611 where the 1769 revision that we're reading here is the word of god perfectly preserved for every generation for us and we can trust it completely it's infallible and perfect right oh yeah uh, I guarantee it the word yeah. of god is alive it's not an old dead book it's not an old harry potter book it's alive it's a living living book living words 100 percent yeah, and so Jesus is the Word of God in heaven, and the Bible is the Word of God on earth. That Bible is alive. Yes, agreed. Okay, so and I'm not sure how if I how far off I got on our topic here, but it's okay. Um, quickly about the binding. Yeah, we set a seal on him in uh, Matthew twelve. Like 24 to 29, uh, the Pharisees, Jesus cast out devils, starts on 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And then this is the verse that kind of shows the binding. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house? the strong man being Satan and his house being this world as he is the God of this world, or how else could Jesus enter into this house and spoil his goods, spoil Satan's souls that he has, except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Yeah. Yes. Could it be, uh, is, is that what that's referring to? Absolutely. I, I, I think that's a uh, parallels exactly. Uh, uh, what we were talking about earlier about how death has the second death has no power over us. Yes, that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah, and just that's how Satan had to be bound spiritually in that so that Jesus could come in and spoil his house and take his goods, his souls that were Jesus's to begin with, so that he could spoil Satan's plans yeah. to destroy those souls basically that's an excellent point okay yeah yep, very good cool yeah very good now i think we could probably find uh 
a number of verses that would support that as well. Uh, but that that's a great one right there. That's beautiful. So he so we know he's he doesn't power over the entire world, but when he gets loosed, that will be different. And that's why I say when he's loose, we will be up in the air. Okay, and I think uh, we're on verse 4 now, I think. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So. Uh, the, the first thing I think uh, the, that really stood out to me, uh, you know, however long ago when I was studying this, uh, you could just type in thousand year Christ. I don't want to be too specific. I just want to be general. I don't know if you've ever done. I'm not sure if this will show us good. Yeah, right there. Right there. Uh, thousand year Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, thousand year reign on earth. And uh, you can do this on YouTube too, I'm sure. And you'll just see video after video after video of that'll say, yeah. I, I don't know how to work my computer. So it, it's it's probably ninety percent plus that'll just have that headline of Jesus Christ reigning a thousand years, but we just read it right here in Revelation twenty. It's it's not talking about Jesus reigning a thousand years. It's talking about uh, the souls of them that were witness for Jesus and the Word of God. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So I guess this isn't going to open. I don't know why. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But anyways, uh, the, that's the point that I want to make. It's not Jesus reigning a thousand years. It's uh, the believers in Jesus that are reigning it's for a thousand years. The actual and, subject of the sentence is right. the believers, not Jesus. Right. Right. Uh, I don't know how so many people got that wrong, but it's it's incredible. And here in Luke 1, verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. So if he's reigning for a thousand years, that, that would uh, in, seem to indicate that his reign is going to be over in a thousand years. And that, that's not what it says at all. Now the reason why it's a thousand years is because we are in this flesh that is going to perish. This flesh that we live in now is not eternal. And so when Jesus comes, we, the first the dead in Christ, and then those of us who remain will be lifted up with Jesus, and we will be resurrected. We will be forever changed. And so that period that we're going through right now is going to come to an end. So there's going to be a transformation or a total change when Jesus comes, he's going to make all things new. So that's why there's this uh, period of time, a uh, thousand years. Um, it, it's it's sort of an indicator of it's n it's not everlasting. What we're living in now is not everlasting. It's a period of time. And so that's my interpretation of a thousand years. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think. Uh... Yeah, it's just like a representation of this last generation from Christ till he returns. Right. The, th the thousand years is just the representation of this last generation before he returns. It's just, it's not exactly a thousand years, but it's just said as a thousand years to reference that it's a large space of time because it's obviously been more than a thousand years. Well, yeah. I, I think it's been more than a thousand years. According to the calendar, it's been two thousand and twenty years since 
baby Jesus was born. 2000, maybe 21 years. I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so I won't get into uh, uh, the little bit of doubt that I have that a thousand years that we're actually 2020 or 2021 instead of 1021. That might be a subject for another day. Uh, but uh, I was having a conversation the other day about that, that maybe, maybe a thousand years were added to our calendar. Have you ever considered that? I've never heard of that, but uh, that's very interesting. Okay, so, <laughs> so some other time maybe we can talk about that, and I'll give you uh, some reasons for why I think it's possible. Okay, so verse 5 but the rest of the dead, now I should say just because if there was a thousand years added, that doesn't mean this is going to be a literal thousand years because obviously uh, we don't know the day or the hour uh, when Jesus comes back. So I, I don't believe it would be exactly a thousand years, although I don't, you know, I just don't believe that at all. I don't think it was meant to be that way. Um, although you like I was reading Exodus uh, today and, you know, the people in Egypt, the, or the Hebrews, were they uh, endured living in Egypt for 430 years exactly? Uh, yep. But I don't think that's, I don't think this thousand year period is exact. Though I think, like you said, it's a representation of, uh, of time. Yeah, I think it's just a representation of a, an age, or this right. last generation, or whatever. That's how I see it anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the rest of the dead live not again <clears throat> until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, so the the rest of the dead, those those that are uh that that will die will will be resurrected. Those that are dead in Christ, right? Like Daniel says, um let's see if I can find that verse real quick. Uh some there's a lot. Let's see how quick this moves here. Okay, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So um, I just wanted to use that verse to show that uh, that sort of parallels this, where <clears throat> uh, those that are dead in Christ will live after the thousand years period, which is consistent with uh, what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, where the first the dead in Christ will rise. Uh, you agree with that so far? Yes, that's, but looking at that, because I was kind of seeing the first resurrection, because there's the first and the second resurrection, I was kind of thinking the first resurrection is like when you're born again. Almost, but it seems to be contradictory to that verse right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that okay, that's that's interesting. I I never thought of it in that way. Um, we're, I always we're, thought of it first. Because uh, we first yeah. Verse, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. No, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I look at the first resurrection as being Jesus Christ. I don't know if I can find this verse real quick. Now we're talking about Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrected. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Am I getting that close? Yeah, he's the first fruits to, he's the first one to go right up into heaven, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, there it is. Okay. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, but now in Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. So now we are to be partakers of that resurrection. Yes. And uh, so he's the first resurrection. When he returns, we will all be resurrected with him. Correct. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, I'm just the the first and second resurrection thing is kind of throwing me for a curveball. Okay. I, I went and read through this, and then I watched some videos and stuff, and I kind of had it 
in my head that, okay, the first resurrection is when you're born again, when you pass from death unto life. And then the second resurrection, I thought, was when Jesus came back. And uh, that's when our bodies are transformed. We get a new body and uh, we get the new body and a new spirit or whatever. Yeah, so I, I think that's fair to say it that way. Uh, I just want to point out that it, there that there's actually no mention of a second resurrection. Okay. So we're partakers. So that's why I say we're partakers of this first resurrection, which will be fulfilled upon his uh, return. Okay, it's the second death. There, yeah, there are two deaths, right? When our body dies and then Judgment Day when we're thrown into the lake of fire. If we, yeah, if we don't believe. <laughs> right, 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 right. For the unbelievers. Correct. Um, so there's one verse I want to point out uh, because I believe there are people that say that that resurrection already happened. Have you heard about this? That the first resurrection? Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. Well, they're saying uh, there are people that say that uh, everything in Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21 has already happened. And they'll point to... Uh, the fact that uh, when Jesus, uh, when he resurrected, he was not the only one that resurrected. Are you, have you heard about that at all? People talk about that? Uh, not really. I'm not sure I can find that verse for you right now because I don't recall the wording right off the top of my head. But uh, So when Jesus resurrected, uh, and out came right there. Out came and came out of the graves after his see. No, that's not. Wait, is that the verse I'm looking for? So uh, when Jesus resurrected, and all right there, right there, okay, and. And behold, uh, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city, into the holy city and appeared unto many. Yeah, actually, I, I read that just before we had our little talk here. Yeah. And then... Yeah, and then the uh, centurions walking, watching or whatever, that's all those things come to pass, said, truly, this must be the Son of God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, so we didn't miss out on the resurrection. That, that was just an event to witness to the world what had happened. Does that make sense? Completely, yeah. So uh, I think this is why... Uh, the point is being made here in Second Timothy who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And uh, I encountered some people um, a few weeks ago that were uh, teaching this, this idea that all these things have already happened. And, and I'm also hearing a lot of people say, talk about... Uh, uh, Matthew 24 uh, isn't talking about the rapture. I hope I'm not getting too far off base here. No, that's fine. Okay, so in Matthew 24, uh, it talks about the gathering of the elect somewhere. Oh, 31. Yeah. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, uh, to me, this that's the rapture. And uh, 
So I don't understand these people that say there is no rapture here in Matthew 24. And the rap the rapture is at the very end, though, right? The last day. Yeah, it's when uh, it's at the it's at the end. Yeah, it's a, I mean that's what they the disciples are asking Jesus about. Tell us when shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he's telling them. And this is obviously when he comes, and that that's the end of the world when he comes. Yeah. At least the beginning of the end, because the you know the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the earth. We're going to be lifted up with the uh, the angels. With yeah. Jesus. So, yeah. So, anyways. Uh, yeah, like it says in John uh, six fifty four. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Yeah, yeah, the last day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, there's a lot of parallels. So that's got to be the last day. And so that's the yeah. day of our resurrection. The great day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord, yeah. <laughs> it's not just an ordinary day, right? Yeah, yeah. You know. Okay, and so verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years there's another reference it's not jesus christ reign, reign. it doesn't say and they shall be priests of god and jesus christ shall reign a thousand years it say it says they shall be priests of god and of christ and they shall reign with him a thousand years it does not say anywhere. I, I just don't understand how people cannot see it. Yeah, because we are literally reigning with Jesus Christ as believers now. Yeah, yeah. And if, well, people will get offended if I say, uh, it, well, if Jesus isn't reigning in your life right now, then you're probably not saved. <laughs> and if you weren't offending people, you wouldn't be doing your job as a Christian. Right, right. <laughs> Okay, so um, so one question you can ask yourself is, are, are we priests of God and of Christ? Absolutely. Is, is there anything in the Bible that would support that? Of course, Jesus is the high priest after the order of Malachi. How do you say that word? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. <laughs> yeah, I, I that one. Okay, so first Peter two, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar mm -hmm. people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Um, right there. It, we are labeled a royal priesthood. Yeah. We are hit the saints, right? That's right. We are the elect. We are the, elect. The we are the saved. We are the Christians. So are are we spiritual? We're spiritually resurrected already in Christ, correct? We've passed from death to life. Yeah, I'm not sure. Right? Is there a Bible verse to support that? Uh. Uh, uh, there's John 5, 24, and verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Yeah. Uh, and then 1, 1 John three fourteen, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Yeah, pass from death to life. Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great point. <clears throat> so that's a, so that would that would uh, fit this um, first resurrection, right? Yeah, like the first resurrection of our spirit is when we become saved, right? 
yeah and then our bodies are resurrected after like i'm i always have problems placing all the intricacies together <laughs> yeah that's an interesting take uh, for sure um of course what i typically say is that we are uh, you know, everybody's born of the water, which means everybody's born of the womb of their mother. Uh, but not everybody is born of the spirit of God, which is from above. And so um, I think in my mind, anyway, these verses like being passed from death unto life uh, coincides with this being born of the spirit, because that spirit that we are born with is everlasting life. And so we will never die, right? And so uh, I, I think that's a great uh, point that you make, is that we're being passed from death to life when we are born again. Yeah, I found another verse that kind of backs that up as well. Ephesians 2, uh, 4 through 6, basically. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that's showing he's raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he hath he hath done it. He has done it. Yes. It's, yeah. not, it's not something that's going to happen. It's something that happens when you are a believer. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Love that stuff right there. Praise the Lord. I'm not worthy. <laughs> no, nobody is, but. Yeah. Uh, we do our best. Yes, sir. And uh, yes, sir. And there's a verse I'm going to just gonna share with you because I was chatting with somebody a couple of nights ago and I couldn't remember what the verse was. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. And uh, it drove me crazy. Oh, yeah. Many times. I can't believe <laughs> I can't remember something so simple as this. Being confident of this this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of jesus christ oh was that like a once saved always saved debate thing no no it was just somebody was saying that they were a new believer and that um they're trying their best and and uh all this and i wanted to give them something really encouraging and i was like oh i can't remember that verse mm. And then later on, of course, and it was too late, I remembered. Yeah. But so, yeah, but so my point was I want people to be confident. I want people to be sure that they know that they have everlasting life. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't want people to doubt. I mean, God, you know, you know, God doesn't want you to doubt, right? And, yeah. Uh, if you have Jesus. doubt, then you can't hardly say Jesus is the prince of peace he doesn't want you to have doubts he wants you to be confident and have that uh, surety that you are saved forever absolutely and god actually gets offended if you uh doubt yeah doubt that salvation i, I can't remember the verse for that but uh <laughs> yeah we can find a bunch of them uh, you yeah. know like when jesus says uh, ye of little faith yeah, he's exactly. always getting on people because they're lacking faith. And that's what happened with uh, Moses and the people um, when they got out of uh, Egypt. They, st I mean, after everything they experienced, they still had little to no faith. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, you you brought us all the way out here because there's no graves in Egypt uh, just to bring us out here to die. You know, they didn't. <laughs> They didn't have any faith, and that's what's going on even still, I think. Yeah, yeah. and even when, even when he delivered the manna from the skies and fed them, they still didn't like it. No. Oh. What, is, what is this loathsome bread? We <laughs> need meat. It's like, fine, I'll give you some quails or whatever. 
Yeah, yeah, it was just it, no matter what, nothing was good enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's unbelievable. And, you know, it it's just, I, I you know, I, I don't understand it really. Uh, maybe I'm guilty of it too, or I was guilty of it. I wonder if I'm guilty of it now. Maybe I'm lacking faith now. Maybe that's why I don't understand something, because I'm lacking faith. Because I really do believe the key to understanding the Bible is faith. Absolutely. And it all begins with understanding that the words in the preserved, the King James Version are the truth and they're perfect. And we have to be able to reconcile the differences that we see through the verses and understand the main of the verses. You got to understand the doctrine from the simple text. You got to, sorry, you got to uh, understand your doctrine from the simple verses compared to the complex ones, if you sort of know what I mean. Yeah. You take the the straightforward verses you base your doctrine upon, and then that's how you figure out the complex ones through those. I'm not, I'm not uh, explaining that very well, but I hope you get the point. No, I do understand what you mean, because, uh, you know, you'll read one verse, it's very plain, you read another verse, and it's, uh, it's like, well, what's that mean? Well, they don't, there's, it's not a, uh, conflict or contradiction. It never is. That should be rule number one. The Bible never uh, contradicts with itself. It never conflicts with one verse, never conflicts with another. So uh, it like what you're saying, if you take that simple Bible or that simple uh, verse and uh, cross it with that more complicated verse, uh, understand that there is not a conflict there. Is that kind of my yes. saying that right? That's perfect. Yeah. Yep. Rule number one, the Bible is right. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And um, so verse seven, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and they went up on the breadth of the earth encompassed the camp of the saints about and the, the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we could probably go over that, but that's, that's really the one event is um, all it, uh, it, it's all, sort of parallels, I guess, this loosed a little season. So when Satan is loosed a little season, this is what happens here. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And these three uh, verses here describe what happens. And, yeah. and of course, Gog and Magog is a reference to uh, Old Testament cities. And uh, so it's not, it's not, uh, not it's not necessarily. I mean, it's not only. How do I say this? It's not this. This applies to the whole world. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's spiritual sort of in nature. Right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, so, and so uh, and they and now this is interesting because. It, it talks about compass the camp of the saints about. And uh, so that's, to me, that's saying it's, uh, oh, how do I say this? They, they have a surrounded in a spiritual sense. And uh, so when we are lifted up, uh, we will be removed from their presence and fire will come down from heaven uh, from God out of heaven and will devour them. Yep. Okay, so, and to me this is interesting because we see uh, this mention of uh, uh, the, of the saints being surrounded. Uh, and do you remember the, uh, verses that talk about that? Um, in the Old Testament, I 
I remember like some of the cities being encompassed and obviously yeah. Jerusalem being encompassed before it was destroyed. Encompassed. Um, I think that's the word. I, I wish I was real. If I was real smart, I'd be able to pull up those verses. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, but they are there. You'll just have to take my word for it. Yeah. For Maya. But uh, I'm not sure that I can recall the wording. Uh, let's see. There's something in the New Testament too, isn't there? Uh, okay, so I don't want to dwell on something I can't remember. But okay, so anyways, uh, so uh, God uh, sends fire, destroys them, and the devil is cast into the lake of fire and where the beast and false prophet are. Okay, and so in my opinion, uh, this beast and false prophet might as well be the same thing. Okay, so I know people talk about what's the beast and what's the false prophet. I'm sure you've heard people try to explain that away, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on, do you have any particular thoughts on that? The beast is Rome and the false prophet is the Pope type thing. <laughs> the the Pope. Is there really a difference, right? Yeah. I mean, exactly. so I see people, I just don't understand people. Uh, somebody today asked me, is, do you think Obama is the Antichrist? <laughs> and that was like five years ago, man. It's time to get out of that. Yeah, that Jonathan Kleck video or whatever, right? Oh, I, I'm not sure I, I even saw it, but sure. I know Obama's been out of power for a long time. He doesn't qualify for the beast in any sort of way. No. And no. I'm just afraid that so many people just aren't reading their Bible. So Daniel talks about four beasts that rise up out of the earth. He names three of them. So that leads us to to know that when baby Jesus is born, that's the fourth beast is in power. And who's in power? Caesar. Right? And so the Roman emperor is the fourth beast, the Roman empire. That's the fourth beast. It doesn't directly say it, but we can uh, deduce it very simply. And so, yes, the Roman empire is the the iron the Iron Empire, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also uh, the fourth beast of Daniel is the beast of Revelation. Yes. So, so when it talks about the beast and the being thrown in the lake of fire, or the beast being in the lake of fire, uh, that's the whole. It's really maybe one simple way to say it's a whole corrupt world system is being tossed into the uh, pit right yeah because it's not gonna uh, it's not gonna transfer over to the new kingdom at all and the false prophet obviously uh, it, it, there's an old saying all roads lead to Rome and the false teachers the false prophets um, are obviously they all stem from the Vatican <clears throat> Yeah, and all the kings of the earth bend down and kiss the poop's ring. Yep. Yeah, and all these modern versions, the popular ones, all have uh, Vatican approval. And I was surprised years ago when I, uh, when I uh, looked in my first Bible that I got, New Jerusalem Bible, and I looked in it and I saw approved by the Vatican, and that's. Uh, <laughs> And that to me, that's crazy that I could just never see it for so long, uh, how corrupt the Vatican is. And you know about the um, Westcott and Hort, yeah, the, the Greek New Testament. That's Necromancers. The, yeah, they, they're all the new Bibles are leaning toward that for some reason. It's odd. Yeah, from them and their their Nestle's text as well. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and so at, at they uh, they tried to kill King James in 1605, 
because yep. they wanted to stop the Bible being printed in the English language. Yep, the gunpowder plot with yep. uh, Guy Fox. Yeah. Who is whose face is the V for Vendetta mask, right? Yeah, yeah. And ten ten years ago there was uh the CIA operation Anonymous, who was a mysterious guy behind a Guy Fox mask. Yeah. And anonymous the CIA operation transitioned to what is called QAnon. And some people simply refer it to as Q. I don't know if you're if you've heard anything about those guys. Yeah, all a bunch of uh, deceivers leading people astray with a little bit of truth, and then a bunch yeah. of falsehood, basically. Yeah. So I I was told that uh, the Federal Reserve was going to go under. It was going to be taken out. And that we're all going to be richer beyond our wildest dreams. And that uh, Trump was going to come back into power. And he was, they were going to arrest all the Democrats. Yeah, all the pedophiles were going to be put in jail. Yeah. And Hillary was going to get arrested. And none of that happened. Yeah. And people still, even though all this time has passed, people still believe it. It's unbelievable. Yeah, so it's crazy. yeah, yeah. So so I think so far we're in agreement with everything we read, right? Pretty much, yeah. I did. I found a verse about the compassing part. Oh, okay. Well, where's that at? It's it was Psalm seventeen, nine, eight and nine. I don't know if it works perfectly, but uh, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes, bowing down to the earth, like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. Oh, I love it. Yeah. From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Yeah. Oh, man, that's good stuff. That's a good find right there. <laughs> Yeah, so that's kind of that kind of talks about the whole thing, right? They're kind of compassed about us, and the Lord's gonna protect us and crush them, and then we will be satisfied and we will awake in His likeness, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Just wanted to get that one in there for you. Oh, that's excellent. I'm sure there's plenty more too. Yeah, that's a good one. And then uh, Luke 21, and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that desolation thereof is nigh. And I, I suppose we could spend an hour discussing what this could mean. Um, what's interesting is when you read Matthew 24 and Mark 13, it talks about uh, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Well, here in Luke, it doesn't say that exactly in in its place it talks about jerusalem being compassed with armies um, and just to give you an example um, would that not be oh, yeah, go say ahead. That again. no go ahead i was gonna say that uh is that not referring to the way i've seen that is that that's referring to uh the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD when Prince Titus came with the Roman armies, compassed the city about, and then crushed it and destroyed Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I... Is that what you believe? That's... Yeah, that's kind of what I believe, I guess. Okay, so... So, all... Let's... And the abomination of desolation, the abomination was the uh, continued 
continued animal sacrifice after Christ had already been the perfect once and for all, once and final, one for all uh, sacrifice for sins, for all mankind, for eternal life. That was a theory I've heard and kind of I have uh, held on to as being the most sense making for me. Okay, so I, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we want to get into that, but uh, there is for, uh, for, for another chat, unless you got something quick. Ah, you know, I, I don't even want to get started. Uh, can I just show one? Just one thing, and then we'll move on. Because I don't, because I, I just don't know. Unless I can tell you for sure uh, what it is, then I can't say you're wrong. You know, I can't rightly say you're wrong or say that people that teach that is wrong. Uh, but Second uh, Peter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. So how would I know that that verse pertains to 70 A.D.? Boy, I, you know... When I the Scriptures don't explicitly say it. No, it don't. And, and then I would have to... See, I'm not, I'm not really being fair to you, man. No, that's completely fair. I don't, uh, I, that is just a theory that kind of made sense with the supposed history of what allegedly happened. So it, that's, it, that, that's, that's not one that I'm holding on to. Like, I'm not going to turn on. That's just what I've kind of understood up to this point. Yeah. If I, if I could be shown out of the scriptures, a better interpretation then I would, uh, yeah. You know what? Maybe we ought to, I, just spend a lot of time talking about that some other time. But um, the obvious thing is, uh, in my opinion, is that Jesus says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So the idea would be that that happened a long time ago. And so that's one of the requirements for everything to be fulfilled. And uh, my interpretation of this is that all these things are going to happen. Uh, we're going to all see them happening. So we can get into that some other time. And then um, there's also like multiple fulfillments of prophecies as well, right? Yeah, that's true too. That's true too. Cause uh, you know, like uh, when uh, God sent the plagues on uh, Pharaoh, uh, that's sort of, uh, uh, I don't know if that's a good example, but it, uh, we also read about the plagues in revelation so yeah so this is a it almost has a double meaning in the sense that uh this is going to happen uh at the end time as well as what happened to pharaoh because his heart was hardened yeah yeah like how the old testament is types and shadows of things to come oh, exactly yeah exactly that's yeah. well said right there yeah so Okay, so you've heard people talk about uh, uh, that um, Jesus comes back. And so this is why I say this doctrine that there's a thousand-year period after Jesus comes back is wicked. It's as wicked. It, it's one of the most wicked doctrines being taught today. Because what it does is it tells the unbeliever... I and mean, if you're going around teaching this stuff and the unbeliever hears you saying that you can wait until after Jesus comes and you'll have a thousand years to repent and believe in Jesus. Well, the unbeliever is going to say, well, I'm just going to wait until I see that happen. And then I'm going to believe in Jesus. I'm going to wait for him to come before I believe. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe. And you, what really burns me, Alex, is I've had a couple of people actually say that to me, somebody really close to me said that to me that they're just going to wait till Jesus comes back before they start to believe and it's too late when he comes back absolutely it could be too late any minute yeah if i mean if you if you put it off another minute man it might be too late <laughs> and right now is the time for salvation yeah the kingdom of heaven is at hand yeah and so here's the problem 
that I have with a lot of people that it, it seems to go in one ear out the other is verse 11. It's the return of Jesus. Okay. You don't see the return of Jesus anywhere in Revelation 20 until verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And of course, uh, and I saw the dead, small and great stand before God and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was found, what well, I'm sorry, who and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is obviously judgment. Yes, sir. And so when Jesus comes in the white throne, that's the judgment throne. And when it says the, the earth and heaven fled away, this parallels what we read all throughout Scripture, but specifically here in Matthew 29, uh, when it says, In those days the, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars fall from heaven. Okay, so I'm not sure. Are you, are you seeing that the same way, the same parallel? That is that is the same as uh, sorry. That's parallel to what again? Uh, the earth and heaven flood away is parallel with the sun shall not give her or sun. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. I never noticed that before, but yeah, that does make sense. Okay, yeah, I mean, so this is what's going to happen when Jesus comes. And it, okay, so then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Okay, so all these things, it's going to be a big event, right? So the and it's the, and right here in verse twenty nine says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay, and then it's talking about the sun, moon, and stars, and the powers of heaven. And there's then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And uh, that's when everybody, that's when the, the show's over. Or maybe you could say that's when the show's about to begin, too. But the show's yeah. over for those people that don't believe. Absolutely. Yeah, and so that's kind of a sign in heaven that here we go. Here it comes. We've been waiting for it. All right. And so I, mm. I equate that with this, you know, whose face the earth and heaven fled away because when Jesus, uh, when everything is completed, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. So this old earth and this old heaven will be no more. Yeah. Well, they'll they'll be burned up, will they not? Yeah. Well, that's what it says, uh, reserved uh, for fire, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it'll be it'll be very interesting. Uh, you know, we get some pretty good descriptions in. Uh, Revelation 21, 22, if I remember correctly, of what it's going to be like when the new city comes down and the living environments and all that. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more tears, no more death. Yeah. No need for a sun, for God will be the light of it. Yeah. Or Jesus will, I can't remember. Same yeah. thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people are complaining about the cold and the snow and all that. And, well, I don't think they'll have to worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so that's what I, I'm, I mean, this right here, verse 11, it, I, I don't see how anybody could get around it. And what I'm noticing is people are just flat out ignoring that. I mean, there's no question in my mind, that's Jesus. And... Where did he go? If if he was already here, is this a second Jesus or what's going on? I, I don't see any way to reconcile that with this idea that 
Jesus comes back, reigns a thousand years, and comes back again. Well, there's no mention of him going away. There's only a second coming. There's no third coming. Yeah. yeah. It's simple, right? It doesn't make any sense. So what they want to say is that Jesus comes back and uh, the unbelievers... The unbelievers still have a chance to be saved for a thousand years. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a doctrine of devils there for sure. Yeah, yeah, I and I got a problem with it. And it's unbelievable though uh, how many people believe it. And I think what's going on is people aren't reading their Bible. What they're doing is they're uh, playing their. Uh, turning on a, a YouTube video, listen to some preacher, and they're going to play their little Facebook games while they listen to the preacher. They're not going to double-check anything that the preacher says. They're just going to take his word as the word of God. And so a lot of people are getting uh, caught up into these false doctrines. And, um, and it's, you know, again, that's what the Bible says would happen too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is that? Uh, how close am I on this? Uh, filthy. Let's try filthy lucre. So I'm, the big money makers are the crazy doctrines. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, so whose mouths must be stopped? Let's see. Nice numbers here. Or is that a good place to start? Verse 11. Uh, Oh, no, okay, yeah. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Who are the circumcision? The Jews. <laughs> Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So these guys are teaching things for money. Well, and what's making money out there? That, Fables. You know, Yes. Fallen angels and giants and yeah, yeah, and that's you know what that's a crazy thing. These yeah. people that are uh, uh, teaching uh, fallen angels had sex. Boy, I'd like to spend a whole hour or so talking to you about that. You know this? It's all based on sex. The whole angel sex thing. People yeah. are obsessed with sex. And it's a big money maker. People are fascinated by it. Oh, angels came down and they just started having sex with women. Ooh, wee, what a time that was. Except that's not in the Bible. But what is in the Bible is knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. How that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust and what was that i i shared with you earlier or no you shared it with me itching ears right yeah and uh for the time will come when they will not endure sound of doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears uh so all these doctrines if they have a hint of some sort of sexual activity run away from it yeah, it's all garbage. All garbage. But uh, it's crazy how many people are uh, falling for it. Oh, it it burns me up, man. Because it's it's right. If you read <clears throat> Revelation, I don't know how anybody reads Gen uh, Genesis six and sees angel sex in that. It's unbelievable. God did not destroy the world because angels are having sex. It says here plainly that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God destroyed yeah. the world because of the human heart. Absolutely. Because they'd spiritually turn their back on God. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid that's what's happening too, and I'm, and I'm, I'm spending too much time talking to people, uh, who they yeah, probably call for them. Yeah, because there was giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Yeah, 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So there were giants before the sons of God even came into the daughters of men here. Like even in the plain and simple text, it's not, it's not saying that the word angel is not in Genesis six anywhere. No, like and God is, God is not the author of confusion. If it was angels, he would make it clear. <laughs> yeah. And let's see, where is that? Uh, oh, I think giant is mentioned like 15 or 19 times, if I remember right. Um, and uh, uh, right here, here's a good one right here. And there was yet a battle in Gath where was it? Where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. So he was born to the giant, and he was a man. So wouldn't that tell you a giant is a man? Yep. Yeah. And that was, was that Goliath's brother in that case, that one? I think it was, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I do, I do, that might be a good subject too, man. If you, you know, I'm not really, I don't talk to anybody like this, but if you wanted to get a routine going, I'm a creature of habit. Maybe we could talk about that too. Um, yes. You know, like uh, uh, Genesis 4, right here in verse 1, it says, When men began to multiply the sons of God, so this parallels that. And then even here, people want to point to verse 4. It talks about giants, sons of God, and then it says, The same became mighty men. It doesn't say they became angels or half angels or hybrids or any of that stuff which were of old men of renown and then you see right here man of his heart and repented the lord that he had made fallen angels oh no it says man <laughs> and the lord said i'll destroy fallen angels no he says i'll destroy <laughs> man you know what I'm saying? It's so it's so obvious what's going, what God is talking about here. And uh, but you know, people like they like Sex in the City and HBO, Cinemax, and all them sex shows, and, and the idea of angels having sex, boy, that just turns them on. They perk their ears up for that stuff. That's what they want to believe. Yeah. That's not in the Bible. Yeah, and then they take the verses out of, uh, what is it, Job 1, 2, and uh, 38, I believe, yep. 37, mm -hmm. maybe. They take those verses and, oh, well, these are confusing and hard to understand. Must be angels. Nope. Uh, yeah, no. I, we Boy, we could spend some time talking about that, huh? But do you have any final thoughts on uh, Revelation 20? Uh not really so basically we've come to the conclusion that the thousand year reign is this period of time basically before jesus comes back satan being bound is a spiritual binding whereas he can't he can't inflict upon us more than we allow type thing he's spiritually bound in the sense that he doesn't have power over us if we choose Christ. Is that kind of what we're thinking? And that, yeah. yeah. And that, uh, yeah, the thousand years after that, Jesus comes back, the wicked are destroyed, and we are transformed type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, we are all things are made new, right? And that's, yeah. um, I think this, like, uh, Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And so that's, that's the end. Uh, you know, there's just no... I just don't see any way how people can... Um, you know, stand on this idea that this thousand years is coming after the return of Jesus. 
does not make any sense whatsoever. And yeah. I've had people ask me about this, um, you know, Satan being loosed, and I've uh, compared it to uh, like if you have a pit bull and you got him on a leash, he's not going to hurt anybody. He's not going to tear the yard up and all that. But once you let him go, if you wanted if you wanted him to tear up your yard or attack somebody, you let him go, right? And so that's kind of what got, in my opinion, just my thought here, that I think God is going to let Satan go to destroy the earth and to kill everybody. And because, um, you know, it's like, it's like the, you don't want to kill everybody, but you'll let your dog go out there and kill everybody. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm saying that in a very nice way or not. But uh, the it's an bottom, interesting, interesting theory. It, it yeah. I mean, the bottom, the bottom line is uh, all the unbelievers are going to die. And uh, there's just no way around it. And then they're going to be judged. And then they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And so God is going to use Satan to uh, do the dirty work, so to speak. Yeah. That's okay. The, that's the way I look at it. I've never thought of it like that before, but that uh, that makes sense. Yeah. So when he's being loosed, there is no restraint on him. He's just going to go nuts and kill everybody, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Because right. he can't. He even in the Old Testament, he couldn't do anything that God wouldn't allow. Like when God had to allow him to. Uh, go after Job and destroy his family and all the, and all his riches and all that. Right. Exactly. So Great Satan, point. Satan can't do anything without God's approval. Right. Because, because he is just, he's a cherub, right? And a cherub is kind of like a, an animal angel in the spirit realm, right? Okay. Did you... Yeah. Do you believe that, or? Uh, that? Well, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't really have a lot of opinions on that. Okay, so I'm pretty sure, like the cherubim are like the. This is what I've heard, anyways. They're like the animal class angels type thing. Like when you hear the cherubs of God, they've got the wings, and then some have the. Well, some do have the face of the man, and or one has a face of an eagle, a face of uh, whatever. They're all the the animal type angels they're not ones that appear as humans the ones that uh, communicate directly from god to man okay but he was he was like the anointed cherub so it's kind of kind of makes sense as he's kind of like god's pit bull let this beast go to <laughs> yeah take everything out in the end yeah and we will be at this point we will be lifted up in the air with jesus and uh and then so Satan's going to have free reign on earth to, to destroy everything. And then it's also important, or uh, interesting, in my opinion, is that uh, we see over and over in the Scripture that it, it, um, uh, all, you know, all this stuff must happen until our enemies are made our footstool. I'm sure you've read that somewhere, haven't you? Yeah. Let's see, like in uh, Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And there's a number of uh, uh, verses, till I make thine enemies thy footstool from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. So when we are up in the air with the Lord and all the unsaved are down below, uh, wouldn't that mean that our enemies are our footstool? Mm. Huh? Mm. That's good. That's good connection. I like that. <laughs> okay. And so then, like in Revelation 3, in my opinion, this, this also parallels it. So, behold, um, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, not them, but you, the believer in Jesus Christ. 
So that when they're gonna they're gonna be at our feet when we're up in the air. And God's gonna make them know that He loves us. So yeah. I think that's just interesting. That's yeah, that's awesome. That's really powerful. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I've heard I've heard people argue that uh, oh, we're not going to go through the tribulation, and uh, okay, you know, uh, now they make big deal out of it, and well, now we have to define what the great tribulation is, and I'm just not so sure that I believe the idea that, like in Matthew 24, no, perhaps we got some thought on this before I let you go. Matthew 24 uh, talks about uh, the Great Tribulation, right? And so they talk about uh, what I was told the, the other day, a while back, is that um, this Great Tribulation, if I can find it, all right, there, verse 21, all right, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Uh, what they say is this is the wrath of God. And uh, we won't be, we won't see the great tribulation. Is this what you believe, or have you heard this? Oh yeah, we're definitely getting raptured away and not feeling tribulation. Kidding? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, no, that's crazy. Of course, we're. Uh, I'm pretty sure it says in the scriptures we're supposed to take joy in our tribulation and. We are to endure tribulation, right? In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, did Jesus himself have any sort of tribulation when he was in the flesh? Yes, of course. <laughs> he suffered mightily. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just stupid to think we'll just be taken out of any punishment like this. This physical realm that we're in, we're meant to experience these things to strengthen us spiritually yes. so that we can be useful for God in the world to come. Oh, well said, man. Well said. All right. Uh, so I appreciate talking with you. I probably took up too much of your time, but uh, uh, it's great to you know, talk about Revelation 20 with somebody that gets it. It's Really it's not that complicated. No, it's not that hard. I, yeah, I like I like talking. I don't have uh, anyone I talk to that's on the same level as you <laughs> for, uh, for understanding the scriptures. Is that right? I, I talked to Steve. He's he's all right. Good servant. He's he's pretty good, but he's still uh, he's still a little bit behind. He still thinks there's going to be a physical thousand year reign and. He doesn't know too much about the two witnesses and all that stuff. I don't know. I just kind of see revelation as all being spiritual. You can't really apply that to a physical sense. It's all metaphorical language, <clears throat> really. Symbolically speaking. Sim symbolically speaking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And so if you want to get together and talk again, that would be great, man. If uh you know, develop some sort of habit of doing it. I would, uh, I would enjoy doing it. It's just my thing is just, uh, you know, I'm so shy in front of that camera, and uh, I don't like to argue. I like to. I don't mind somebody having a different uh, opinion. Uh, I, I I enjoy that actually, but um, sometimes you know people they can't handle it very well. Uh, yeah. So I, so I had the last time I talked with somebody, uh, I I didn't feel like uh, any anything I said mattered to them, uh, and so uh, it was a little disheartening because uh, if you don't have a foundation, okay. So the last time I talked to somebody, uh, they were they were not a King James Bible believer. And so they wanted to talk about something else that was in the Bible. But my point was, if you don't have that foundation uh, for the Word of God, 
then all this other stuff doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, because you could just say, well, this word in Greek means dog. Even though it says cat, this word means dog. Well, I can't have a discussion with somebody that that can play that sort of game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you have to at least, you have to build off of the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ, which is the word of God, which is, if you do the research, the King James Bible, it, it proves itself through, through its language, through its prophecies, the way it all comes together perfectly. The language in the Old Testament lines up with the language in the New Testament, even though they're written in different languages and thousands, like a thousand years apart or whatever. It all lines up perfectly. There's no contradictions. You look at the new versions, they take out whole verses. They change verses to make Jesus so that he's a liar. They, yeah, they, they change all sorts of stuff. It's just, it's just outrageous. I don't understand how so many people can go by these friggin' Catholic Bibles. Uh, you know what it is, Alex? They're not reading their Bible. They can't be reading their Bible. If they were reading the Bible and studying it, they would see these these problems. But they're not. I mean, you can't. You can't be reading. You can't be a serious Bible reader. And like the NLT will say that, um, like Titus, was it Titus 3 or whatever? Uh, reject a device of man or a. Reject the man that uh, causes division. There's no truth in him. And then you read in Luke, uh, what is it, 17 or whatever, I'm not sure, where Jesus says, Think not that I've come to bring peace on earth, but division. Jesus is telling you in these newer translations that he's come to bring divisions. At the same time, these newer translations are saying, Reject the person who brings division. Yeah, or they'll say, they'll say Lucifer and Jesus are both the morning star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that goes along pretty good with uh, Mormonism, because they believe Jesus and Satan are brothers. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mormonism is just way out there. Oh, Same geez. with Jehovah was Witness, but they believe Jesus was the Archangel Michael in the Old Testament or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. never mind what the Bible says. This is, it's unbelievable. It's, it's like they're just totally disregarding the Bible. But yeah, so, but these people that are buying these new versions, they are um, doing it to make themselves look good, to feel good, but they're not actually reading the Bible. See, that's how I came to it is I was reading all these other versions, and I was noticing discrepancies, differences, and, and complete contradictions. And uh, so you've probably heard somebody say, well, you got to go back to the originals. Yeah. All right. So has anybody ever been able to show you the originals? There are no originals. There's only copies of copies of copies. <laughs> Everything is a translation. Everything's a copy. The Word of God is living. It's not stuck on some manuscript from what you know, whatever time age. Somebody the other day was telling me, uh, "You gotta, you gotta uh, go back and read the Septuagint." And I'm, have you heard somebody say that before? Yeah, people are like, oh, the Septuagint's good, but it's like, no, yeah. it's not. Well, well which it's... one, which one are they talking about? Is my is my first question, and because there are there are different ones, and then uh, they said uh, the XXL or whatever. Then I don't even know what it is, but it's the the Greek, uh, uh, what they say, the Greek Old Testament. Uh, that was uh, a Greek translation of the Hebrew before Jesus was born. Uh, so, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one, but no. Yeah, so the so the 
so they had the Hebrew Old Testament and they translated it into the Greek. So you got an Old Testament in Hebrew and you got an Old Testament in Greek. And so if you can trust that Greek Old Testament, why can't you trust an English Old Testament? It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, and so, but I I suspect that these people that most of them, they don't they don't know what they're talking about when they say go to the originals. What they're doing is they're going to their Strong's concordance is what they're doing. Yeah, but a Strong's concordance isn't a translation tool. It can help you to bring up some deeper understandings of words you don't quite understand. But the people who did the translation, the almost 50 people or whatever, who took seven, seven years to do it uh, in three different places, they had the best knowledge of all, all the uh, <clears throat> languages in the world of those days. They knew the, the turn of phrases. They knew, they, knew every, they knew better than basically anyone knows the Hebrew and the Greek these days. So I'm going to trust that the Spirit of God worked with them and preserved the word through their knowledge and that they got it right and that God did as he said and preserved his word perfectly and pure for all generations. Right. You're talking about the King James translators, right? Yeah, the King James translators because, yeah, because of their ability, character, and integrity. Yeah. And... Um... And yeah, it's it's interesting because uh, you know a lot of their uh, a lot of the verses that they ended up using came from William Tyndale about you know yeah. two hundred years. If I'm getting my numbers right, William Tyndale was about two hundred years before in fourteen hundred, give or take. Does that sound right? I, I hope I'm, might, I thought it was fifteen. It might have been fifteen hundred. Yeah, it might have been 50 years. I'm not sure. But however long it was before. I like, yeah, I don't know. In my head, I'm thinking 15, 17, but uh, I have. I've That's been... probably right. Uh, but uh, if you read the Tyndale Bible, you'll, you'll notice uh, a lot of similarities. And that's simply because, um, you know, either Tyndale had it right or uh, the, the, trans, the King James translators. Uh, we're able to to make it more fluid. Yeah. More consistent with the scriptures. So it's, it's obviously, in my opinion, that's obviously uh, a beautiful translation. It's almost poetic in that it's perfectly written. And that's one of the first things I heard when I was a believer is how poetic it is, how smooth it is. And, uh, well, that's the way it should be, shouldn't it? If it's the Word of God, there should be... It should almost sing to you. Yeah. All right, man. I've taken up enough of your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, we had a good talk. It was nice. Maybe if you want to do uh, another one next Sunday, I'd be down. All right. Yeah. Let I'll get a hold of you, or you can get a hold of me anytime, and uh, figure out a subject. Let's uh, let's sleep on it, and then maybe uh, I'll contact you tomorrow and, and come up with the subject. Yeah, fallen angels. Fallen angels, okay. All right, I'll confirm with you later on this week. If it's not tomorrow, it'll be soon. Uh, but that's a good subject, though. So, so have we? Can, there's a whole lot of scripture we can get into to hammer that point home. Yeah, William Tyndale, death October sixth, fifteen thirty six. Fifteen thirty six. So, okay. That's when he died. That's yeah. Yeah. So he was into life or whatever. Yeah, I tell people that um, uh, the the Catholics they were very they killed him, but at least you know they had some heart. They uh, they they made sure he was dead before they burned his body. So well, that's good. Yeah, that was nice of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his wasn't his dying prayer was like. Uh... Lord, please open the eyes of the King of England. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. And that's, it took a while for that to happen, but it did happen.
that prayer was answered. I do believe, I do believe King James um, was probably uh, was probably uh, you know was a saved, born again Christian. Could very well have been. I mean, who else would um, bother to go to all that trouble to get all these great translators, all these great men of God? And King James himself knew the Bible very well. And have you ever read any of his uh, his books, like on demonology or whatever that word is, demonology? Uh no, no. King James wrote wrote uh, books on demonology. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting. The guy knows the Bible. Solomon must come up a bunch. Yeah, yeah. He. Uh, and you know he it's it's not uh it, it's not what people imagine it's not what i imagined anyway it's not like uh it's not like people that study demons today it's much it's very biblical related very much related to the bible so anyways uh it's nice talking to you man i've taken up enough time it's getting nice. late for me yeah i bet nice talking brother <laughs> all right we'll talk to you later man yeah, take care.